Hello, hi. Uh, my name is Andrew Barton. I'm an assistant professor at Scripps Institution of Oceanography and University of California, San Diego Division of Biological Sciences. Um, <clears throat> today I'm going to talk about microbial diversity, community structure, and endemism in a coastal upwelling biome. Uh, this work is a broad collaboration across, across many people named below. Um, of course, uh, depends upon, crucially, uh, some of the students who are terrific, who really push this work forward. I just want to name Chase James on the left and Rob Lamp on the right. Uh, these are two uh, up and coming students who I'm sure everybody will be hearing uh, more of in the coming years. Um, in fact, Chase James will have an e-poster, which I encourage you to uh, take a close look at. So this session, this session is talking about combining um, uh, chemical, oceanographic, and genomic measurements. And in so doing, there's the potential to answer uh, many kinds of ecological questions. So uh, Evelyn Hutchinson uh, famously visited this sanctuary of Santa Rosalia in Sicily. Um, and in a little pool near to the sanctuary, there were two kinds of water boat. Corixa punctata and Corixa finis. And Hutchinson noted why there should be two or not 20 or 200 species in this pond. And so ecologists have long wondered about the controls of biodiversity. There's also the uh, boss Becking hypothesis, which many of us have probably heard about. And it basically postulates that everything is everywhere but the environment selects. Uh, this is uh, illustrated in this beautiful. A model simulation by the Darwin Group at MIT, including Mick Follows, Stephanie Dukevich, and collaborators. And here you see uh, the, a global model, which the different colors show you the kind of the, the relative dominance of different kinds of microbes living in different parts of the oceans. And so the basic idea is that the dispersal and population sizes of these microbes allow, allow them to live everywhere, but the environment sort of picks who can live where and what relative abundances. Uh, there's also uh, this uh, idea that, you know, we have a pretty good idea of where common organisms live. So, you know, here's a, a picture taken from a mammal guidebook of different kinds of squirrels. And so I picked the eastern gray squirrel, uh, which has this range you see in the bottom. And that's relatively well known. You know, you can go out, you can see it. Uh, and I would submit that uh, nothing really similar exists for marine microbes. Um, but that by combining all these different observations, perhaps ultimately we will know a map like this for the distribution of many of these marine microbes. Um, now, this is, I'm not saying that uh, there haven't been a great deal of progress uh, towards these goals uh, in the last many decades. Uh, and there's some amazing examples. So, Sir Alistair Hardy here uh, has his uh, famous plankton recorder. And it was a very crude but effective instrument for sampling plankton in the ocean. Uh, and it's towed behind ships. And if you, you see the tracks on the top right, if you are able to sample plankton across many places in a long enough time, you see how they change and how the biogeography of a lot of these organisms changes. It's a spectacular resource for all of oceanography and ecology. And then there are satellite uh, algorithms for estimating uh, plankton functional types from space. And I just show you here, Harata, 2011, and you have, you know, the different colors show you, you know, the relative abundance of different kinds of plankton uh, or phytoplankton. Here, the colors are the percent of total chlorophyll. Um, all of this uh, is uh, fantastic, but many of these uh, studies of marine macroecology have been limited by insufficient spatial coverage, infrequent sampling, and or low taxonomic resolution. It's not to say not a great deal has been learned. Um, and that the doors have really been blown off in the last uh, decade or so by these mega transect studies like Tara and like Molluspina. The top left map here shows you the distribution of Tara uh, oceans samples uh, between 2009 to 2013. 
uh, all in all major ocean gyres. Fantastic resource, tremendous uh, coverage across ocean biomes, uh, and something similar for Malaspina. And a massive amount is being learned by looking at the uh, you know, biodiversity of microbes from these studies. Uh, and what I really want to talk about today is another study in this vein called the NOAA Calcoffee Genomics or NCOG project. Uh, now, this is a, uh, a survey along Calcoffee lines in the California current. You can see the data coverage here in the top right. This is the California coast. Oops. And the, uh, uh, you can see the different lines coming sort of uh, across from the coast. And then the colors here are the number of samples that have been taken. Uh, and so this data set is incredibly rich. I was started by Andrew Allen and his uh, collaborators in lab. Uh, and it measures the diversity of prokaryotes and eukaryotes. And so uh, this is using the V4 and V5 region of 16S for prokaryotes and the V9 region of 18S for eukaryotes. Now, what is interesting and unique about this survey is the repeat sampling. So there are four cruises per year on the Cal Coffee lines. And this is data I'll talk, the data I'll show you today are from 2014 to 2020, but it is ongoing, you know, of course, subject to the funding. Uh, and uh, there's this great spatial coverage. So you span from the coast in these upwelling areas to the subtropical biome offshore. So there have been nearly a thousand different independent samples taken. And from that, something like 50,000 distinct ASVs have been observed, or ASV stands for Amplicon Sequence Variant. Uh, and that basically means the, the, uh, they have an identical sequence to one another. Uh, when, what's great is that this survey also, because it's on the CalCopy program or co-located with CalCopy, also has co-located physical, chemical, and biological observations. So this is a really unique resource that allows us to sample both time and space to learn about fundamental questions about microbial ecology in the ocean. And so I will just touch on a few uh, today. These are obviously broad. I won't hit everything. Uh, the first one I want to talk about is what are the patterns and drivers of microbial biodiversity? And then we'll talk about endemic and cosmopolitan species. And lastly, I'll just briefly hit on uh, the factors that shape community structure and biogeography. And I leave this topic mainly to Chase James's poster uh, uh, in the meeting. So uh, what are the patterns of biodiversity in this region? So the unit I'll focus on here are amplicon sequence variants or ASVs. You can think of an ASV as sort of like a taxon sort of species like. Uh, and this map in the top left shows you across 16S and 18S the total richness or biodiversity of ASVs. Uh, and then the figure on the right shows you how that varies in distance from the coast. So zero is near the coast and uh, 500 is far from the coast. Uh, and the blue line is alpha diversity. Alpha diversity is just the average number or the number of species present at a given place in time. And so alpha diversity is lowest near the coast and it decreases away from the coast. And you can see that in the map. Uh, now, Gamma diversity is just sort of this overturn, uh, um, you know, and that here we define that as just how many species are present in total over the year. And so you see um, these two patterns, basically higher diversity offshore, lower diversity near shore. And then when you look at the total species present over the year, it's higher than the species present at a given time. That makes sense because you have this change uh, in composition of the community over time. Uh, the bottom left here is just various uh, definitions, given that you can stop and read those. I won't go through them, uh, but that's just to uh, make sure we have all the terms right. Now, does this pattern agree with what we found in other surveys like Tara? And the answer is basically yes. Uh, so this figure is from Ibar balls or Ibar balls. I'm, I'm not sure how you pronounce it exactly. Uh, Fantastic paper. It summarized the sort of latitudinal diversity gradients from the Tara Oceans data. And we have prokaryotes on the left here and then eukaryotes on the right. Uh, 
it shows essentially that diversity is highest in the low latitudes and it decreases away from the equator. Um, this is uh, similar in spirit to what we're finding here in this upwelling zone, that the, the more nutrient uh, rich and colder areas tend to have overall lower diversity than the warmer uh, subtropical regions. Uh, so no, this is not to say that all organisms behave this way. So for example, diatoms uh, show an inverse pattern. Uh, this figure on the bottom is just the, uh, the map on the left shows the mean alpha diversity for diatoms and it's highest near the coast. Uh, and you can see that in this um, uh, figure on the right, it summarizes that there's this opposite pattern from the rest or it's sort of the total microbial diversity. Uh, and so basically what we find is that the diatoms, you know, slightly behave differently than other groups. And there are other groups that have that as well. And so I just wanna stress that here. Um, this is a, a lot of information here, but let me just explain basically what this means. So if you look on the Y, on the y you see all these different possible environmental factors that may influence the diversity pattern for different groups of microbes along the x-axis. So Prochlorococcus, Synecococcus, diatoms, and so forth. Uh, the circle size tells you whether it's really important or not for that microbe. If it's important, it's big. If it's less important, it's small. And that's determined by the AIC score uh, from the GLN model. Uh, the color tells you whether that environmental factor is correlated positively or negatively. And so the, the big takeaway here is a couple. Number one, not all the groups have the exact same predictors. So there, you'll often see discussions in papers about, well, what controls biodiversity? And the takeaway for me is that different groups have different factors controlling their patterns of diversity. Uh, but one can generalize and say that in this particular region, the provision of nutrients is very important in determining alpha diversity, whereas temperature, which is often speculated to be a really important factor, does not really appear to be that important here. Uh, and you can see that if you look across the rows, mean temperature, you look across these rows, yes, it's not negligible, but it's not nearly as important as nutrient supply. And in this context, nutrient supply, for that we're using a proxy, which is the nutricline depth or NCD. Okay, um, next I'm gonna talk about a little bit about um, endemic microbial species and how they're distributed across the ocean and also cosmopolitan microbial species. And I hope you'll see how this connects with that everything is everywhere con, uh, uh, theme that I brought up in the beginning. Uh, so just to sort of step back in place, some of these data in context. This is a really interesting figure that shows you essentially how the um, ASVs in the NCOG survey in the California Current are linked to other areas of the ocean from Tara. So each box is a different region of the ocean and the size of the box is the number of ASVs or amplicon sequence variants that are present. Um, this figure is just for 18s for eukaryotes. And here in the middle, you can see the NCOG box. And so just looking at it closely, you can see, okay, the number of species or ASVs in the NCOG area is less than the whole North Pacific Ocean. That makes sense because, you know, there's, the North Pacific Ocean is bigger. Uh, the bars here uh, show the degree of similarity with other regions of the ocean. So basically how many of the ASVs in NCOG are found in the South Pacific Ocean, North Pacific Ocean, et cetera. Uh, so it makes sense. There's not a, over, a lot of overlap with the ASVs in the Southern Ocean or the Arctic, um, but there's, a, there's quite a lot of overlap with nearby regions and it generally the overlap decreases with distance. So overall, something like 50% of the ASVs in the NCOG project are found somewhere else in the global ocean in Tara. Um, and so we took this to basically ask, you know, are there any endemic species in this region, the NCAR region? So we essentially calculated on a per station basis, the rates of endemism. And so for each NCAR station, we asked, is there, are there any ASVs that are found only here 
at this one station. Uh, maybe not surprisingly, uh, very, very few of the ASVs are you know, endemic to one station. Uh, now that may seem obvious. If you look at this picture in the bottom right here, this is a Landsat image showing um, uh, mesoscale and submesoscale features in the ocean. This is, uh, you see the plankton uh, uh, and phytoplankton and chlorophyll. You also see all the fronts and filaments. There's a lot of currents and a lot of mixing that facilitate high dispersal and connectivity throughout this region. Uh, so, you know, there's a great amount of exchange between these stations. And so the, 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 the potential for them to have truly endemic species is quite low. Uh, but um, leading into the next slide, really, so this cow coffee grid is fixed sampling. So, but these habitats, you know, offshore, nearshore, they move around. And so what we sought to do was to be able to basically quantify where the habitats were and then ask whether the habitats have endemic species. To do this, we use a machine learning tool called self-organizing maps. Uh, basically, the idea here is you're finding which samples have similar environments, and you're going to project that back on the map. So a classic famous example is for the, basically all the countries on Earth and all these metrics of human health and well-being. Um, and then you cluster all of the uh, different countries based on these metrics into different nodes. Uh, this map here in the middle, each, each tile is, uh, or sorry, each node here has uh, countries that are most similar to each other in terms of human health and well-being. Uh, and then you can cluster them based upon similarity between these different nodes, and then you can project it back onto a map, and you can basically find, you know, certain regions and countries have similarities or differences on human health and well-being. And so we do something like this for the uh, environmental variables at NCOG, temperature, salinity, and nutrients to try to separate out habitats. Just to illustrate how that works, here's temperature on the y-axis, salinity on the x-axis, uh, and then the size of the circle here is total nutrient. And so the red dots are the sort of offshore cluster and the nearshore cluster are the blue dots. Uh, and then we found basically the number of the ASVs that were endemic to that habitat. Rather than this Eulerian stance, you know, this you know, station by station basis, we said, we know these habitats are moving around. Let's just, quant let's just calculate the number of endemics per habitat. And when you do that, that rate of endemism goes up. Uh, and we find that about 8.74% of the ASVs are endemic to the near shore. And then 25.5% are endemic to the offshore. So offshore endem endemism rate is notably higher. Uh, now, uh, that is not to say that some of those endemic species in this region aren't found somewhere else. Uh, and so in fact, we compared this back to the Tara Oceans data, and we found about 25% of those you know, regional endemics from the NCOG are found somewhere else on Earth in Tara. Uh, so, um, you know, some of those endemics are probably not found anywhere else on Earth, uh, but some of them are. But we hope and think that this, this pattern of this kind of nearshore offshore gradient is robust, uh, and it's a very interesting one. Um, another, another interesting, uh, I think, takeaway for how to think about this is related to sampling method. Um, so, two plots here. Uh, on the y-axis in both is the number of endemics, and on the x-axis is basically the number of uh, stations sampled on the left, and on the right is the number of cruises. And this is all for just the NOAA Cal Coffee Genomics Project data. And so the takeaway here is that uh, the more you sample, you're likely to find fewer and fewer endemics uh, because you are uh, really you know, you sample the heck out of it. A lot of those things that you found, you know, in just one spot, if you look long enough and hard enough, ultimately you're gonna find it somewhere else. But the other thing here we found is that it doesn't go to zero. We have no evidence that it goes to zero. And so we do think there are things that are truly endemic to the California, the Southern part of the California current ecosystem. Uh, but your ability to find them uh, in your estimate of rates of endemism is gonna be 
critically tied to how frequently and broadly you sample. Uh, so we think that repeat and broad scale sampling is really crucial to study uh, patterns of endemism and biodiversity among marine microbes. Now, another interesting thing uh, is this concept of cosmopolitanism. So if everything is everywhere, you know, one might expect that in theory you could find lots of microbes in you know, virtually everywhere. So we, using the, calc, uh, the data from NCOG, we looked for ubiquitous and cosmopolitan species. So we define ubiquitous species as uh, something that's present at every station and every cruise, which is a, obviously a high bar. And cosmopolitan is an organism that's found at every station at least one time. Uh, and this table here uh, summarizes the total number of ubiquitous in the top row and total number of cosmopolitan uh, in the bottom row ASVs. And I just want to point out that these numbers are very, very low. Uh, so uh, cosmopolitan ASVs in this region are extremely rare and ubiquitous ASVs are even rarer still. Uh, recall that you know, the total number of ASVs is in the tens of thousands. So these are very, very small proportions. Uh, like endemism, when you increase sampling effort, it decreases the likelihood of finding a cosmopolitan ASV. Interestingly, the, uh, the, the, the organisms that are really widespread tend to be heterotrophic bacteria, like SAR-11. That makes sense given they have uh, small, small size, great dispersal rates, and huge populations. Uh, uh, so for example, these 33 of the cosmopolitan ASVs, many of them are different uh, ASVs of SAR-11. So uh, last theme to talk about is what are the factors shaping microbial community structure and biogeography? Um, for this, I refer you to a great e-poster by Chase James. Um, Chase has been doing excellent work in uh, understanding the factors that really shape microbial communities. Uh, and all I will say as a teaser is um, that changes environment structure microbial communities. And so this plot on the left shows the Bray Curtis community similarity versus distance. And then on the right is Bray Curtis community similarity versus Euclidean environmental distance. So essentially how different is the environment? And so there's this, you can see a steep decrease here and a more flat decrease in the left. And that tells you that environmental change is really strong factor shaping microbial community similarity. This is relevant because there's a lot of discussion about whether dispersal and neutral processes are important in shaping microbial communities or uh, local uh, environmental uh, selection. See Chase's poster for more on this um, uh, in more detail. So some takeaways, uh, just a you know, brief overview. In terms of pattern diversity, diversity generally decreases in nearshore habitats. Um, the annual total at a given location is greater than the diversity present at a given time due to this computational or compositional overturn. Certain microbe groups don't follow this pattern. Diatoms are an exception. They have higher diversity near the shore. And uh, the diversity gradients do not appear to link to the temperature, or do not appear to link to temperature, but to environmental or nutrient uh, availability instead. Uh, so some of the global surveys suggest that temperature is really important. We're showing that in this region, that's not the case. Now, in terms of endemism and cosmopolitanism, uh, nearshore habitat has a lower rate of endemism than the offshore. Um, now, many of these uh, regional endemics are also found in Tara. But one thing that's clear is that the cosmopolitan species are extraordinarily rare, and that the ubiquitous species are almost non-existent. Sampling effort obviously has an important influence on this. And uh, this is an emerging picture, is that uh, seascapes have uh, endemic species, but not necessarily in individual locations. So the appropriate unit for thinking about where endemics live in the ocean is like a habitat that is similar. That's sort of like a biome or, or a habitat, but it moves around in time. So you have to track those uh, moving habitats and look for the changes in community structure within them, and then the endemics and diversity within them. Um, lastly, uh, you know, genomics are but one way of sampling the ocean. So I just wanted to highlight uh, an additional tool that I and many others are working on 
Um, and this is the California Imaging Flow Site of Odd Network. So basically, along the California coast, where there are these red circles, we have uh, have or are deploying soon imaging flow cytobots. These take pictures of microbes in situ, and you can use different tools to identify them to species level. So with this tool, you'll be able to understand things like harmful algal blooms, also uh, compositional change through time, um, effects of regional and global climate change. Uh, so this is going to be a really powerful tool for analyzing how um, microbial communities along this coastline change. Um, there's a huge network of collaborators involved here, and this is a, hopefully a long-term project. But uh, I believe that this uh, linkage of genomics with these imaging uh, tools is a really powerful uh, way forward to thinking about both changes in community structure and diversity at the time and in space. Um, with that, I really want to thank the organizers of the OCB workshop and also the organizers of this session in particular uh, for inviting me. Um, I look forward to a conversation during the actual day of the session. Thank you.